take out our Bibles. Hey. And I guess we'll begin in somewhere. <laughs> yep. You know, let's go to Job chapter 34. We'll do a little bit. Not in sequence right now, but Job, which is right before Psalms, so that helps you find that. I think everybody knows where Job is anyway. To me, that's one of the interesting books because I, I read parts of it. I, I'm not sure who to believe or what to believe when I read the book of Job because uh, Job's, as he called them, miserable comforters. So we read what they said about things, too. I mean, their dialogue is there in the book of Job also, isn't it? So as I read what they have to say, I think, now, is that right or is that wrong? But it's kind of interesting. You have to make those discernments, and you can always check it out with other parts of the Bible, too. But they said a lot of good things. Even though they weren't real good friends, they accused him of being having sin in his life. Some people think that the only reason that things go wrong in a person's life is because they've got some sin. That's the consequences of sin. So they think, well, there must be something wrong with me here. I'm doing something wrong. And, well, it might be. They might be doing something wrong, too. But there's times when you're going to have problems in your life that are not because of your personal sin. And God allows. Look what Jesus Christ went through. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And he was perfect. Amen. He was without sin at all. So sometimes they're caused by our sins, though, also, absolutely. But in Job, let's see, we're going to talk about holiness tonight, Job chapter 34 and verse 10. Uh, just one quick verse here. Now, the holiness we're going to talk about, first of all, we'll talk about the holiness of God. And then we'll talk about holiness as it's connected with mankind, too. So holiness with God, holiness with mankind. And Job verse, uh, chapter uh, 34, verse 10. Wait, I'm going to have to get a little light up here or something. It's getting harder and harder to read my Bible there. Uh, verse 10, there it is. Okay, Job, Job 34, verse 10. Therefore hearken unto me, ye men of understanding. Far be it from God that he should do wickedness, and from the Almighty that he should commit iniquity. Verse 10 is saying, God has no sin in anything he does. He's always righteous. He's without iniquity. One of the verses I've memorized recently talks about he's re without iniquity. That's yeah, Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 4. Uh, God without iniquity. And he cannot do anything wrong. He does not do anything wrong. Everything, every decision he makes is right. Amen. Every decision he makes is for the right reasons, the right motive all the time. Always right. So that verse 10 there, therefore, hearken unto me. So listen to this. Hearken. You're going to hear a lot of people saying a lot of things, won't you? Yep. Yep. Turn on the TV, you'll hear all kinds of things. Yep. Uh, how much right, how much wrong, you have to kind of use some judgment there. Yeah, don't, don't believe everything they tell you on TV. Right. That's, that's all I'll say there. But therefore, hearken unto me, ye men of understanding. Far be it from God that he should do wickedness means he won't do witness, and from the Almighty that he should commit iniquity. Not at all. Not at all. All right, let's look at the notes then. And on the back side, on the back side of the notes, the back side, about halfway down. On the notes, about half, back side, halfway down, just above the long line. It's above the line. You see three lines. I just want to give credit to where I got most of this information. Now, when I do notes and outlines, I, I read from other people and commentaries, and I, I mix in some of my own thoughts, too. So it's kind of a mixture of everything. But I did get a lot of information from three, these three sources. And I could say four sources. I could say Ed David Cloud to it in his Way of Life Encyclopedia, and I used some information there. But what I looked under holiness in the Way of Life Encyclopedia by David Cloud, he quoted somebody else. I mean, almost everything he had there was from somebody else, too. So he was quoting somebody else. So I want to be, I guess, just let you know who I got most of this information from. The first one is Henry C. Thiessen, Lectures in Systematic Theology, and Emory Bancroft, Christian Theology, Systematic and Biblical. In fact, those two books were my textbooks when I went to Bible college. Henry C. Thiessen, Henry H. Bancroft. I remember going to the book book uh, store, that book, yeah, book room, book table, bookstore, I also call it bookstore, to 
buy my books as a new, as a new student at Baptist Bible College. But Henry C. Thiessen, good. Emory H. Bancroft, real good. And also William Evans called The Great Doctrines of the Bible. And we do have a copy of William Evans out there, The Great Doctrines of the Bible. His is a little shorter, a little bit simpler, but also some really good, good information there, too. So just to let you know where I get most of this information from. I want to be kind of above board about that. All right, back to, back to the front side. All it is that we have the verses and references there. And then Roman number one is definitions and applications. Letter A, when holiness is not. Now this list I pretty much made it by myself except for the last one or two there. When holiness is not. First of all, it's not sinless perfection. Now as Christians, we should strive for holiness. The Bible says that. A lot of people, not a lot of people, but people will say that, oh, I know you can't become, you're not going to be holy. And they're making that as an excuse for not even trying to be holy. Yeah. Not growing in that. They say, well, I'm never going to arrive. I'm never going to be perfect. So why even try? Well, is that the Bible attitude in back of it? No, no. We're to strive for holiness. But not sinless perfection. Number two. It is not to be understood as the charismatics believe, that is where you can lose your salvation if you're not, uh, you sin to a certain degree or certain, sin a certain amount of time again, and you lose your salvation, so you have to get saved all over again. So it's just kind of like throwing the dice whether you, you're in a lost condition or a safe condition when you die. Hopefully you'll be in a safe condition when you die, not a lost condition when you die. What a way to live. You know, what a way to live. Not knowing for sure if you're going to make it or not. I like what the Bible says. You have to have that assurance and confidence. Amen. And when you're born again, you know, you know. He that hath the Son hath life. Hath life. Amen. So it's not understood as a charismatic. Some of their churches, they even call holiness churches. And those are some of the real wild ones. I mean, they get real emotional ones. That's a better word for it. They get carried away emotionally. And they believe that's the Holy Spirit of God. And they're out of control. They don't practice temperance. Like the Holy, like the fruit of the Spirit is temperance. Temperance means you're controlling yourself. If you're out of control, that's not the fruit of the Spirit. Number three, it is not Phariseeism, where you believe you're so holy, you're, it's, uh, you've earned salvation, it's self-centered good works. Not Phariseeism, when you start to look down upon other people, because you, you're more spiritual than they are, you think. And just by thinking that makes you not as spiritual as they are. Just by thinking that destroys your spirituality. Number four, it is not a good work for salvation. Well, that's obvious. Number five, it is not a one-time occurrence. It's a growth. It's a growth. And not, all of a sudden, you're not holy. I remember one, uh, Brother Bill Shackford over at Lincoln Church, he was, he was doing some block work, and he was telling one story. So he ran across this one guy, one man, and he was saying... The man says, well, I'm, I'm a Pentecostal and I, uh, I've been washing the blood, I've been baptized in the Spirit, and I'm just, and, uh, and, and Brother Bill, no, 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 no Pentecostal doctrine, he says, well, so you're perfect then? And he says, yes, I'm sinless. And Brother Bill looked at his hand, and in his fingers he was holding a cigarette, oh, wow. a lighted cigarette. And, and Brother Bill just looked at the hand there, and he looked back at the man's face and the that man looked down and realized what Bill was thinking, you know. And he said, well, not right now. <laughs> okay, not right now. Yeah, so not right now. So it's not a one-time occurrence. It's a growing and like, well, there was one. Number six, it is not achieved by personal effort. I could almost put the word only in there. Because our Christian life, we have to put forth personal effort too. Like, you put some personal effort forward to come to church tonight. Amen. You made yourself, you know, get ready and get dressed up and get in your car and drive over here. That took personal effort to do all those things. But all it is, so your personal effort is involved in that, but it's not just personal effort. That's, then you can brag about yourself. Number seven, holiness is not the opposite of impurity. It is itself purity. So when there's any kind of sin involved, it's not holiness, it's not pure. Number eight, holiness, it, now this I got from one of the books there, one of the theology books. Holiness is not God's self-love. 
in the sense of supreme regard for his own interest and happiness. Now, again, I got this from the theology books. The next line I think will make it a little bit clearer exactly what they're saying. There is no utilitarian, you might add the word motive in there. There's no utilitarian motive. What does that mean? It means it's only important because of its usefulness. Usefulness. The one message I bring on every once in a while, uh, consider the lilies. But one of the things, one of the thoughts on that message there is that God just gave flowers in this world to have something pretty to look at. There's no real functional utilitarian use other than that. So it's, the holiness of God is not important just because it's useless, but because, because God is holy. It's element in holiness. There's no utilitarian element in holiness. In other words, God is not holy just because it achieves something. He's holy because he's holy. Now that does achieve some things in us too, which we'll get to a little later. But I thought that was an interesting way of looking at it. And then number nine, holiness is not identical with or a manifestation of love. Not connected with love. Now, since I brought up that subject, the study I did the last several days getting his outline together. One thing really struck me. If Again, it's on the notes there, about two-thirds of the way down on the front page. You see the big check mark in the box? The big check there. Look right there. This is what impressed me the most about the study on holiness. If there is any difference in importance, difference in importance, in the attributes of God, like if there is... If you say one attribute of God is more important than another, if you could say that, if, if, in the importance of the attributes of God, that of holiness seems to occupy the first place. Amen. It's more important than his other qualities. Hmm. Now, again, there's the big if there, too. But I thought this was interesting. The one attribute which God would have his people remember him by more than any other, and why? Because it's brought up more in the Bible. What God wants us to especially remember, he brings up more often. More often. Holiness. Some 30 times does the prophet Isaiah speak of Jehovah as the, the Holy One. So the holiness of God is emphasized more in the Bible than his other attributes. Right. Now, does that make it more important? No, it's all part of God. But in a sense, if God really wants us to know something, believe something, uh, he's going to talk about it, say it, mention it more. And the holiness of God. Now, Here's how subtle Satan is. Instead of emphasizing the holiness of God, he directs people to emphasize the love of God. Yeah, yeah, my goodness. You see what I'm saying there? See how subtle that is? Well, God is love. Absolutely he is. God so loved the world. But the Bible emphasizes, even above his love, God's holiness more than his love. Preach that. Say, isn't that important? That's why we at our church, that, that could be years ago, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It doesn't say Savior shall be saved, the Lord shall be saved. His, his holiness, the holiness of God has to be met. And only to what Jesus Christ did for us will the holiness of God be satisfied. Amen. The holiness of God. You see how subtle that is? That subtle little change there. Not of, of holiness and love, but not, not eliminating it, but changing the emphasis from love, or I'm sorry, changing the emphasis from holiness to love. Yeah. Yeah. Just a change in emphasis. Curious, isn't it? Yes, sir. Interesting. How subtle, how wise in his wickedness is Satan. How wise in his wickedness. Again, let me read that about the big check mark because I liked it and I want to read it again. If, if there was any difference in importance in the attributes of God, that of holiness seems to occupy the first place because it is brought up more. Uh, the one attribute which God would have his people remember him by more than any other, more than any other. Some 30 times does the prophet Isaiah speak of Jehovah as the, the Holy One, the Holy One. All right, let's look up a few more verses then we'll continue with the uh, letter B here. But let's look up Leviticus chapter 20, verse 26. Oh yeah, by the way, on the back side, on the back side, the bottom half of the back side, there's four different references there, and I uh, 
wrote those wrote those uh, verses out, left some blanks, so you can do a little homework there. Yeah, but let's look up Leviticus 20, verse 26 in the Bible and see if you can find it. Yeah. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. Oh, by the way, I did make a mistake. I did make a mistake here. It's on the back side. Uh, the second verse where it says Leviticus 20, verse 26. On the back side, Leviticus 20, 26, there towards the bottom. And the last word there that's a blank, it has that there should be five letters. It's actually only four letters. The last blank, there's four letters, not five letters, so cross that out. I was getting a little tired last night. My eyes were starting to cross. And I was... All right, now Leviticus uh, chapter 20, verse 26. The holiness of God. The, the, the emphasis that's put on it, too. Yeah. That's why a lot of people say, well, the Old Testament God is different from the New Testament God. No, he isn't. He's still holy. Old Testament, New Testament. He was emphasizing something here, though. Something very, very important. Uh, verse 26. Sorry, Leviticus chapter 20, verse 26. And ye shall be holy unto me. Now, those two words are important. And ye shall be holy unto me. And now, there's unto my holiness. One of the definitions of a holiness is to be separated unto. To be holy, separated unto God. So they need to be separated unto God. We need to be separated unto God. For I, the Lord, am holy. He's talking about his righteousness there. And have severed you. I like that word, severed. Like, I picture a knife cutting something in half. Remember when you took a big blade and you whack a watermelon in half or something? Or you take a, uh, an axe and you, you cut a... Tree, a tree limb off or something, you know, severed, severed you from other, from other people. There's certain people I don't want you around. I've, I've separated, severed you from other people. There's certain people I want you to be separated from, severed from people. That ye should be mine. If you're not severed from these kind of people, separate from these kind of people, then you're not God's. Well, that's a strong verse, isn't it? That you should be severed, severed. All right, back to the front side. All right. Letter B. Letter B. What it is biblically. And I divided this into two parts. Holiness in God. And then further on down on the front. Holiness in man. But let's read the first part. Letter B. What it is biblically. Holiness in God. Number one. God is holy. In this sense, we're talking about sinless. Perfection in all things. This means that God is absolutely clean and pure and free from all defilement. When you get up in the morning, you might take a shower, bath, you know, wash it up. You just feel clean, you know, after you take a shower, bath, or something. You just feel clean. As the day goes on, uh, things change. <laughs> you might get a little dirty doing something or other, and, uh, and just, but God is clean all the time. Absolutely perfect, pure, and clean. Free from all defilement. Absolutely perfect. Well, we can't say that, can we? No, we sure can't say that. When we think about things and things come into our life. And, but God is absolutely perfect all the time. Amen. Number two. God's holiness speaks of his exalted status. God is way, way up here. We're down here. Now, when God saves us, when God revives us, when we confess our sins, God is not going to keep us down here. He wants to raise us up higher. You see, the world doesn't like that. Even Christians feel uncomfortable with that. Christians, we should, okay, here's, here's a good way to say it. We should be better than the world, not be, but, but not become proud of it. That's right. That's, good. That's, good. That's a good way to say it, isn't it? We should be better than the world, but not become, be careful not to become proud of it. Good. Those that are better than the world, but become proud of it, what are they in the Bible? The Pharisees. So we need to be, don't be uncomfortable if you make other people feel uncomfortable around you. Now be careful that it is real, real, the right kind of thing too. Be careful that you don't feel proud of making people feel uncomfortable around you either. Well, that pride thing really comes in, doesn't it? So easily, so quickly. But it was God's holiness speaks of his exalted, exalted status. 
And he's trying to bring us up to his level. So we, because the Bible says, be holy. For I the Lord thy God and holy. To be like God and holy. Which would exalt us then. But then don't become proud of it. We're just sinners saved by grace. That's all we are. Don't become proud of it. Number three. God is holy in all that he is the source and standard of right. Okay, Deuteronomy 32, verse 4. Numbers, Deuteronomy. This is the verse I have memorized, but I always have a hard time starting off with verses. So I'll just read it. It'll be safer. Deuteronomy 32, verse 4. Oh, yeah. I should be able to. Let's see. He is the rock, his work is perfect, for he is a God without um, For all his ways, all his ways are truth, a God of, don't tell me, a God of judgment without mercy, just and right is he. That's pretty good. Deuteronomy 32, verse 4. He is the rock, his work is perfect, for all his ways are judgment. There, I got the truth and judgment first there. Our judgment, a God of truth and with and without a thing, we just and right as he. Deuteronomy 32, verse 4. Now, when people say, they make any accusation against God, that he's not fair. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 4 answers that. They're wrong. They're wrong. God cannot do anything unfair. He's absolute truth. He's absolute pure. He's absolute holy. He cannot do anything unfair. That answers it right there. Maybe, well, uh, because the reason this verse is in the Bible, maybe because people were already criticizing God. And so God wanted to make something very, very clear that he can't be wrong. Everything he does is right. Everything he does is fair. Amen. Absolutely fair. He is the rock. His work is perfect. For all his ways are judgment. A God of truth and without iniquity. Just and right is he. Then that was better. Deuteronomy 32, verse 4. Absolute truth. He can't do anything wrong. He can't do anything unfair to anybody. He's fair with everybody because he can't be unfair with anybody. Amen. Deuteronomy 32, verse 4. What a powerful verse that is. Memorize that verse. That'll be good. So God is holy in, in, and he is the in holy and that he is the source and standard of right. Always right, never wrong. Everything he chooses to do is just right. You say some people, well, they, they leave this world, they die at a young age. Is that right? They didn't have a chance to live out there. Yeah. Everything God does is right. Don't question God. Don't judge God. Right. You're going to find out in the long run you are wrong. If you don't find out you're wrong in this life, you'll find out in the next life you were wrong. Don't be, you know, be careful of that. Don't, oh yeah, here's a good way to say it. Don't be right too late. Isn't that good? Don't be right too late. All right, God is holy and that he's the source and standard of right. Number four, God's holiness should, yeah, should bring reverence, awe, adoration, submission, love, worship, conviction, fear, and anything along that line. Proverbs 15, verse 9. I just put one reference there. I could have put a whole lot more, but let's just look up one at least tonight. Psalm, Proverbs 15, verse 9. Yeah, don't be right too late. Don't be wrong too long. There we go. Don't be wrong too long. Don't be right too late. There it is. Proverbs 15, verse 9. The way of the wicked is an abomination unto the Lord. But he... But he loveth him that followeth after his righteousness. So people, we need to follow God's righteousness. God loves people that follow his righteousness. Such an important quality there. Such an important quality. All right, look at the list again. Number four was God's holiness should bring reverence. Don't tell jokes using Jesus. And, yeah. I, didn't want, I didn't want to tell jokes using Moses or anything. Good. There's just not a reverence. There's a lack of reverence in that. Amen. I don't like that. Uh, God's holy should bring awe to realize how holy God is. We just should step back and uh, in awe. Yep. 
you know, just our jaw will drop on here. Wow, look at you know, God, how awesome he is. Right. In adoration, to adore him. Mm -hmm. God, the church wants to adore Mary. No, no. Adore the Lord Jesus Christ. In submission, when we realize how good he is, how wonderful he is, how powerful he is, how holy he is, we have to submit to him. Submit to him. We need to love him. There needs to be, should be a love when we see how holy God is, that he also provided for forgiveness for us. That ought to cause us to love him and what Jesus went through. Uh, worship him. It ought to bring conviction when we compare ourselves with God himself. We ought to be convicted we're nowhere near that level. We need to fear him. The God that created this universe yeah. in just a matter of a couple of days could have done it, could have done it instantly, the whole thing. But I think he delayed a day at least so you can write in the Bible, we can understand it a little clearer too. But the, the, God, the God of this universe, fear and so on. Okay, number five, number five. By the holiness of God, we mean that he is absolutely separate from and exalted above all his creatures. And that he is equally separate from moral evil and sin. Separate from sin. Can I, can I have sin in heaven? And there's only one heaven, by the way. Right. There's only one heaven. There's not two or three heavens. Uh, like the Mormons teach. I think there's three heavens in the no. Mormon afterlife. What they teach. But uh, after this life, it's heaven or it's hell. There's no other choices. No other locations. Make sure you go to the right one. But you can by the holiness of God, we mean he's absolutely separate from exalted above all his creatures. So nobody, in, in heaven, there's either perfect people or forgiven people. And the Bible makes it very clear there's no perfect people. Nobody's sinless. So everybody needs to be forgiven. And Jesus died for our sins. Again, he's the Savior. Amen. Number six, God's holiness manifests itself in the hatred of sin and separation of the sinner from himself. He is against sin and against sinners. A Psalm chapter 94. You're still in Proverbs, just back up a little bit to Psalm 94. We need to be against sin, but we need to also be concerned about sinners too. But God is against sin and sinners because sinners choose to sin. Yep. With their will, they choose to sin. So God is against sinners, but also there's a part of God that loves them and wants to see them saved to be forgiven. But Psalm chapter 94, verse 1. O Lord God, to whom vengeance belongeth. Yeah, Romans chapter 12 talks about that. Uh, not to take vengeance in our hands, but God, God will take the vengeance. See, when we take vengeance in our hands, we're hurting ourselves. God did not create us uh, emotionally to be able to handle vengeance. Vengeance is self-destructive. When we want to get back at somebody, we have that kind of anger brooding inside of us, dwelling inside of us. That anger hurts us. Yeah. That anger, that, uh, that vengeance, that attitude of vengeance, it hurts us. It hurts us. Uh, so remember that too. But God will take vengeance and he'll do it perfectly right too because he's fair, right? Amen. So when God takes vengeance, he's fair. To whom vengeance belongeth, he will, he will bring a judgment. O oh God, to whom vengeance belongeth. Wait, was that a repeat? Yeah, it's a repeat. I wonder why. Uh, o oh God, to whom vengeance belongeth, show thyself. Oh, there's, you know what this verse is, what, he, what this is saying here? It's God, you're the judge. Judge. You need to show your judgment here. Show your judgment on those people that do abortions. Do your judgment, your vengeance on the, the wicked people in this world that are yes. taking advantage of others and yes. hurting and harming people like the most helpless, the most helpless of all. That's right. Now look at verse 16 also. Who will rise up for me against the evildoers? Yeah, who will rise up for me? And we do it the right way. Or who will stand up for me against the workers of iniquity? So who will rise up for me, for the Lord, against the evildoers? So we need to preach against things. We need to preach against abortion. We need to preach against sins. But again, at the same time, Desirous to see them saved, you know, too. Amen. That's where the, you have to have the right balance on it. But I like that verse 16. Who will rise up for me against the evildoers? God's looking for people to take this ministry on, this job on. Or who will stand up for me against the workers of iniquity? 
speaking out against them in the right way. Look at Proverbs chapter 14, Psalms and Proverbs chapter 14, verse 35. Uh, yeah. The king's favor is toward a wise servant. The king there would represent the Lord God. But his wrath is against him that causeth shame. Against him that causeth shame. To be against these things now in the right way, we don't take law into our own hands in that way. God has set things up in this world, but we can speak against things. We can preach against sin. Yeah. Uh, we can let people know we can uh, vote and vote to the right way, too, uh, for those that uh, are uh, for the right things and uh, those that are against the wrong things. We can vote the right way. We can preach against it. We can tell people about it. But, our main, again, our main job is to get people saved, too. All right, Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 26. Ezekiel 26, beginning verse 1. To be against these things. Ezekiel 26, verse 1, And it came to pass in the eleventh year, the first day of the month, that the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, because that Tyrus has set against Jerusalem, aha, I was pointing out their sin, she has broken, that was, that was the gates of the people, she has turned unto me, I shall be replenished, now she is laid waste. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Tyrus. And will cause many nations to come up against thee. When God is against someone, he breaks his vengeance and he breaks that into this world, in situations in the world that others will be against them, and others will bring God's judgment on them for him. Behold, I am against thee, O Tyrus, and will cause many nations to come up against thee, as the sea causes its waves to come up. What does that mean? That means a lot. A lot. God brings his judgment in this world through situations. Through situations. All right, so those are some of the ones from number six here. God's holiness manifests itself. Number seven, holiness occupies the foremost rank among the attributes of God. And I got this in a couple of those theology books. And I read that one part already. And then number eight. Number eight. It is the attitude by which God wanted to be especially known in Old Testament times, in the Old Testament times, the holiness of God, that God is holy. We have all those references. How are we doing on time? Let's look up maybe one or two of them. Since we're, let's see, Ezekiel, let's turn to Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 23. by which God wanted to be especially known in the Old Testament. Yeah, again, yeah, that's not the verse I wanted, is it? No, I don't know. Okay, that's not the one. Okay, let's go to, back to Ezekiel, chapter 39. Back to Ezekiel there. Ezekiel chapter 39, verse 7. It says, So will I make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel. God's going to make his holiness, the holy name, known. God, people will be looking to God more than they ever did. So will I make my holy name known in the midst of my people and I will not let them pollute my holy name anymore. Good. Now, how can he do that? Well, God says he's going to do something. He knows how he can do it, too. Hey, uh, hey, hey uh, my holy name anymore. And the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. Not only his people, but the heathen, the lost people around there, too. People are going to know that God, the God of the Bible, people are going to know the holiness of the God of the Bible. You know, people are wondering, what are all these, some of these calamities, these natural calamities we're having in our, our country? For, for several years already, 
We see the hurricanes coming in. We see the tornadoes. We see the wildfires out there in California. We see the extreme cold and snow all the way, I mean, all the way down to Texas, Texas, and uh, all the problems that go along with that. Is is God in back of that? I think so. I really believe He is. Yeah. It, it, that's let me say this. That's certainly not a blessing, is it? Uh, that. If God's protecting someplace, as He will protect His people, uh, that's not protection. That's calamity. That's problems. I believe He's in the back of all those things. Amen. He's allowing that to draw people's attention to Him. He's bringing a vengeance. He's bringing a judgment. But He's also in back. In one of His motives for bringing judgments in, at times is that people will look to Him and turn to Him. Amen. That's, if, if the love of God and the goodness of God and the plenty of God and the protection of God isn't working in getting people to look to Him, then He'll try something else. He will go the other way too to try to get people in back of it all is God trying to reach out to people, trying to get them to look to Him. He has all the answers to all our problems. Amen. All of them. That's what He wants to do. But people turn from Him in those things. It's a turn away. So, number nine, number nine, We'll stop here at number nine. Because of the fundamental character of this attribute, the holiness of God, rather than the love, the power, or the will of God, should be given first place. Let's just read a couple of verses in Psalms. Psalm chapter 47. And verse 8. What God will do, the holiness of God, the thing that impressed me the most in my study, getting ready for this time tonight, is again, the holiness of God is emphasized over other things. It's brought up more often than his other qualities are. And that says something too. So Psalm 47, verse number eight, God reigneth over the heathen. God sitteth upon the throne of his holiness. His throne is holy. Psalm chapter 89, verse 14. Psalm 89, verse 14. Psalm 89, 14. Justice and judgment are the habitation of thy throne. Amen. Mercy and truth shall go before thy face. I like verse 15 too. Blessed is the people that know the joyful sound. They shall walk, O Lord, in the light of thy comfort. Yeah, but verse 14, justice and judgment are thy habitation of thy throne. And then chapter 97, Psalm 97, and verse 2. Uh, A fire goeth before him, and burneth up his enemies round about. Uh, the holiness of God brings in judgment. The holiness of God is right. And when anybody wants to criticize God for doing the, even the smallest little things wrong, Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 4. He is the rock. His way is perfect. I'm sorry, his work is perfect. For all his ways are judgment. A God of truth and without iniquity. Just and right is he. Amen. Deuteronomy 32, verse 4. Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you for this good study tonight. Thank you, Lord, for your word that we can study and believe and obey. So thank you, Lord, for your blessing. We talk about your holiness, Lord, and you need to be looked upon with great awe and fear and wonder and love and even joy, even joy, because we know that justice and judgment and rightness will win out in the end. Because yeah. you, you come back yeah. someday and straighten everything out. Yep. So thank you, Lord, for that. Thank you. We can be on the right side now, too. Yeah. We don't have to wait till then. Back. We shouldn't wait till then. It might be too late to be right. So Lord, bless now as we're dismissed. Thank you for the, this time in church. Continue to bless as we give out the gospel too, because people need the gospel. In Jesus' name I pray and ask it. Amen. Amen. Amen.